is the executive uh, director and president of the board at Khan Lab School, uh, which is an independent school associated with Khan Academy. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to Dominic. Good evening. So first of all, I would like to get a sense of how familiar you are with the Khan Lab School. So please raise your hand if you have heard about Khan Lab School. Wow. Probably all those who have already talked to, right? And, and who has no clue about the Khan Lab School? Okay, great. That's the reason why I'm here tonight. So, to get started, what is Khan Lab School? Khan Lab School was also founded by uh, Saul Khan, uh, who founded Khan Academy. Khan Academy has 30 million users online, and Saul Khan founded Khan Lab School to disrupt um, the traditional classroom, to disrupt the school artifacts, the school traditions, what we have. And I will talk about that very uh, soon about it. The Khan Lab School is actually a K-8 at the moment, kindergarten grade 8. We're opening very soon, um, also high school, and uh, has the mission to, to pioneer new models who put the student at the center. Today, tonight, if my the clicker works, we would like to focus on, first of all, kind of how we disrupt the classroom. Second is kind of how we scale this whole initiative, because we would like to do a global scale of this flagship that we're developing now in Mountain View, Silicon Valley. And then lastly, it's like how do we use the power of technology to humanize this classroom? So when I give a little bit of outlook, what are the pain points of education and what is actually the need of EdTech uh, coming uh, down the road? So, but first of all, I would like to tell you a story about why I joined this whole gig. When I met Saul Khan, we talked about the vision and we shared it uh, very nicely together. But it was like long back when it was middle school, college time, I was sitting in those math lessons listening to my teacher and 45 minutes and he was scribbling something on his chalkboard and at the end a formula came out. So I was super bored, I was waiting until it was like putting down the formula and so I could get started on the spreadsheet. But if I would have gotten you know, the formula already beforehand, I would have been finished with the homework already. So that being said, you know, I was so bored so I was reading newspaper during that time and the good thing is I didn't learn a lot of math, but I learned a lot about politics during that time, right? So that's one of the reasons I say, hey, what is then the problem in, in today's education in, in the classroom? And uh, you may know Daniel Pink, he's a famous author um, of the, the book A Whole New Mind, and he describes kind of the problem in four different ages, which is the farmer age, kind of the industrial age, um, an information age, but now we should be in the conceptual age. But it, I have the feeling we are somehow stuck still in an information age regarding the education, regarding the classroom here. And he further describes the conceptualize with six different concepts, with six different layers. And at the bottom you see meaning, you know, an accumulation, not only accumulation, but also meaning. If I would have you know, it, it was not a lot of meaning during that time, during my math lesson, what I was listening to, to the lecture of, of my math professor. Um, but if he would have created some meaning out of some application during that lesson, it probably would have meant something to me. Design and story, I brought with you two pictures um, who illustrates that. You know, two girls on the left, you know, discussing something on a dry rails wall. This is two pictures from, from, from the school, actually. Uh, how did they, they reflecting on processes and transformation? So what did they do wrong? What they did, uh, what they can improve it? And they're discussing that on a dry erase wall. They're not getting a lecture there. And on the right side, we have a student who did a 3D model design. So it's one of the concepts of, of Daniel Pink as well. So, so that being said, so what is then missing in the whole thing? And we know it's a problem of like stuck in the classroom, but what is actually, what is missing in, in, uh, in education today. And I think there's two things, and it's relationship, ownership, uh, which are the key to success to learning. But that implies that the teacher, the educator, and today we heard it doesn't need to be only an educator, is giving up control. Again, ownership and relationship are key to success in learning. And B, the teacher, the educator, needs to give up control. So the role of a teacher is changing totally. 
So that leads me into our model, what we have at Calm Life School, which is based on four pillars. First, we have the approach uh, to learning, which describes kind of our approach to the mastery-based learning system. And I, I will elaborate a little bit later on what that actually means. Then we have the architecture of learning, um, talks about the timing of school, how long a uh, day should look like, do we need classes, do we need grade levels. Last, the third thing is ac academic and character outcomes, which are really important. We define that based on a graduate profile. If a student is leaving our school, how that student should look like. And last but not least, it's the art of teaching. Usually, that's missing in all the education models, that's talking about the teacher role. So A, the teacher role is changing, as I said, from um, being uh, a lecturer, more being a tutor, a creator, a mentor, a lifelong learner. The student role is also changing. The student is not anymore the consumer, but the student is also more being more a creator. So two roles are changing here. So let me elaborate a little bit more about the details. When I go to approach the learning first, the details are coming down on the side. So, and I have all the details here. If somebody's interested, I can send you an email, just ping me. The first one is personalized learning. So our school is personalized. That means um, when we look at the weekly thing, so we have a weekly schedule of a student, they're not going from class to class, so from biology to science to maths to geography, whatever. Um, they're having a weekly plan where they have free slots and they can plan their math lessons, their geography lesson on their own and be leveraging edtech tools, online tools such as Khan Academy, such as other tools online. And, and they can put that stuff together. But here we have the teacher role is like they're meeting them once a week in a one-on-one -on -one setting, which are talking about the objectives with the students. So they're taking 30 minute time and talking about the, the, with the student together what the plan should look like over the next two, three weeks. And the personalized level is not only on the content, the core skills, which is an important thing for maybe they transition up, but it's also on a context, context level. So it's really important that they apply their content into context. And our contexts are the projects what they're doing during the afternoon. So that could be really interesting thing. Currently, they're talking about Olympics in our middle school and have to come up with different countries um, to get the bid for running the next Olympics. And that incorporates a lot of different math and physics and transportation issues, business plan pages, etc. So the, everything what they have learned in the morning, not everything, but most of the, uh, the stuff what they have learned in the morning, they're applying in the afternoon during three hours project time. Remember, when you were at school, did you have time to work three hours on projects during the afternoon? And that's the second level of personalized learning. And then the last level is the conceptual level, where we also personalize. When I was at school, I memorized all the states of Africa. And now I can remember today, one day, it's probably Egypt, because I was there on vacation. Or I had to memorize like 200 stones, right? Why do I have to learn 200 stones and memorize those accumulation of content that I'm never, never going to use, right? So, and there's one stone I still remember because everyone was leaking on that stone because it was a salty stone. So we had like a test where all the stones were literally um, on, a, on a bench and then we were like at like 10 minutes to identify the, the stone and we were going from stone to stone and everyone was leaking at one stone, right? So to figure out if that is the, the more salty stone. So it was really stuff that I think that's the level of what we're looking at. The conceptual level would be then in Africa, would be talking about the culture, talking about the systems, the conflicts, and the tribes maybe. So I would still remember today the content. So the personalization is on three levels. On the content level, where we leverage a lot of edtech tools, um, and I think that's really important that we have good tools there. Then the contextual level is with applying their content, and the last level is then the conceptual level of it. Um, we have no grades, so and they can take as much time as they want. Um, there's an evaluation for sure after seven, eight weeks, and we're talking about um, project evaluation. They have different rubrics. They have peer feedback, self-assessment, and also teacher evaluation. So it's a combination of different feedback modes there. Um, in regards to the architecture of learning, so there are no grade levels, so we have no classes. So there's like one room, and around that we have breakout rooms. And it's really cool is we're having independence level, which are dividing kind of the classes up in how much guidance you need, how, how good can you manage time, you know, are you focused, 
Are you motivated? All these, or how good can you collaborate? All these elements play a way major role compared to what we have the silos currently, where they're moving from first grade to second grade to first grade, and etc. So who defines then who is moving up, right? So in our case, we have performance tests where we see how the kids, how well they're doing in those different um, criteria that we are setting. And there's no stress about that because it's not, oh, you're your first or second grade. No, it's about how well you uh, contribute to those uh, different things. Student agency is key, so they're guiding themselves. It's interest-based as well. We still have a cohesive structure in place because we still have like requirements that we have to fulfill. That's clear. We have an extended year, so we have less vacation. And the cool thing here, we had just a family who traveled abroad in, in India uh, to um, serve a charity there. And it was amazing what, what, what they did. They checked in with the lead advisor, that's the homeroom teacher educator for their one-on-one -on -one check-ins once a week. So they called in from India to check in with the teacher quickly what they should do on their weekly plan. And then so that, that, that student could then continue to work on, on their project application in India with the charity, but also on the content during the time. So we give a lot of flexibility for, for families who are traveling and we're monitoring all the objective on uh, the learning relation management thing, which I completed to it. And the, the mixed age is also cool because there's, uh, they're learning from each other, from the peer learning. And last but not least, the learning space, um, it's a key thing. As I said, we have no walls, and we already think about furniture, how we put that together. So we're disrupting everything what the classroom uh, encompasses, actually. Um, when we go to the academic character outcomes, um, we're talking about the graduate profile. And here it's at the bottom we see foundation fluencies, which are the core skills, which are really, I think, important. And not I think, I'm convinced they're really important. But as important are character strengths, um, the social emotional part of it, um, display grit, being resilient. I think those things you never can learn in a classroom where you get lectured. And those things you learn in project based learning in the, during the afternoon. And I think that's a key element, how we differentiate ourselves. The second part is the cognitive skills. Our students have to learn in early days already a lot how do they communicate in front of different audiences, in front of different modes, maybe also in different languages, right? So we started already in kindergarten that they have to present that. So their project, what they're doing. So that's really challenged that. And there's also transfer skills, there's also research skills what we're doing so they know already what data is reliable, what is valid in today's world. Because there's a lot of stuff on the internet what seems okay, but it's actually not. And in terms of portfolio, uh, it's not just an e-portfolio what, what we know, oh yeah, we upload some documents and then it sits there and sits there, great, we did it. No, what we want to do is like a Facebook timeline, what happens on September, September 20th. Um, it's actually there with reflections, with, with achievements, so they can scroll back and forth and there's no report card. I'm not printing a report card for my students, but we have a timeline where they can scroll go back and forth. And the cool thing there is once they're graduating from high school later on, we're building high school next year, is they can pick and choose the project which they want to show to colleges. So they go with the portfolio and say, oh, I'm going to take the project from September 20th, and I'm going to take the, from November also that project, and then I'm going to move forward with that, and that's my application then for whatever um, university they're going to apply for. This is also quite disrupting, so because we don't have any grades, but we have this, all this reflection on it, this evaluation from different educators, which are going to be collated in those timeline portfolios. The last A is the teacher role. As I said, the teacher role is changing completely. It's going to be more a coach, a mentor, a curator of different projects, also an assessor. So what we did here is like we did with the staff with uh, Google has a great uh, Ochidin survey about how they're working with their employees together. And we adopted that and we did be to our needs in school and we had a one-on-one. -on -one um, recording what we did when they talked to the students and then afterwards we analyzed that with the team and, and everyone disclosed his feedback, how can you improve the relationship with the students during those one-on-ones. Because you have only 30 minutes, you have to be really smart what you're going to say during those 30 minutes and what kind of questions you're going to ask during those 30 minutes. And I think that's the key thing. And also, um, we're trying really to be a global citizen. Um, it's a key thing. So, and I think that's what I look in a, in a trade as well in terms of like the educators today. So we have a, a huge kind of idea 
initiative which is, has a lot of demand for this flagship we're building right out now. But the question is, how do you, well, what is our plan to scale this entire initiative? And it's based on three layers. And we heard today, focus, and I think focus is also my word here. I think I want to focus on this flagship, make that right. Our MVP is almost really refined, but there's no pilot, no reiteration, so we can really scale very soon in that regards. But I think it's key that we focus on this flagship to make it right, because otherwise it's always at the expense of the students and the kids, which is not good. And we have a lot of data mining, you may laugh about that, but we have a lot of data that we're collecting from our assessments with the students. At the moment, we are looking into kind of connecting the data into a software that we can analyze that on dashboards, so we exactly see what, where a student is in the whole thing. You need to think about, we have 100 students right now, and everyone is on a different learning path. How to track all those students when everyone is personalized, right? So we have a huge software in place uh, who manages that. Um, the second layer of our scale will be the teacher academies. You think about, oh, how are you going to scale in public school with the unions, with the constraints, with the politicians, with the government? It's like, I'm going to do that bottom up. You know, we're going to provide teacher certification where they can learn how to do the one-on-one, -on -one, how to set up these weekly plans, this goal tracker, how we call it. So we certify them and we're trying with the governments to work on that. It's an incentive structure behind it in the salary table so they can move up their salaries faster than before. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, so that's the next step we're going to do, building these teacher academies and also um, listening and, and talking to a lot of people today. I think the second part is also the management, the leadership is, is, is as well. We should actually create an academy for that as well. So I'm going to add that to my slide very soon. The learning relation management software, the key is what we all know is LMS, learning management systems, right? Where the, the data is connected to a software. Nice, this is done. What we're focusing on is the relation management, and, and that encompasses much more. It encompasses the entire communication with stakeholders, internal parents, students, etc. So it's not just like the data that you upload. It's a living document where we track things. So what we are building right now is like it's really cool. So uh, on a term, on seven weeks, you have the objectives, and the students can drag and drop what they want to do during like from 10 to 11, they can drag and drop their objective over there. And they see not only quantitative objective with 80, 90% of what they're achieving, but they're seeing also qualitative objectives, which is I think really important. So the shift from quantitative, oh, I achieved 80%, what does this mean? Actually nothing, to more, more qualitative process. Last but not least, we're going to leverage Khan Academy for sure. We're going to share a lot for free and you know, how we do projects, how we do this one-on-ones, etc., and how to structure the school. So we're going to record a lot of things online, which we're going to uh, make available very soon on this 30 million user platform at the moment, uh, operating in 190 countries. Last but not least, is uh, also ambassadors and local partnerships. So that's a scaling vehicle that we're using as well. Uh, maybe uh, unions, maybe like teacher, like educators. There's big, big groups in, in, in the US, but also in Europe, how we can leverage. And last but not least, you know, the regular thing in franchising, licensing, so full program, maybe just a partial license of certain elements that our school is doing. But also tapping into accreditations. We're talking about B, maybe there's a partnership with IB that we can leverage suddenly, like, quite quickly in one from five million students what they're serving today. But also it gives an opportunity for all, all ed tech firms who are sitting in that room, you know, scaling within our learning relation management program because we make accessible that ed tech tool within our learning management if we check if everything is okay. So there's a lot of opportunities and win-win situations in, in the scale here. The last question is how can we use then this power of technology in the classroom? And first I want to talk about the pain points that we have. And we have uh, several pain points in education. A is the, that we create lear authentic learning opportunities. It's a key thing. We're talking here about how we can leverage the, the VR. And I have great meetings with Lapster, for example. So how we can do that and how we can embed that. Um, the second one is developing the character strength and the cognitive skills, the whole social emotional part. So how can technology help there us in schools and how to analyze that with patterns, with haptic feedback when we talk about um, uh, VR, etc. So there's a lot of stuff what, 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 what we can leverage there. Then assessment and feedback is a key thing. Um, how to provide uh, that on a, on a sustainable um, a track. And last is reducing complexity. You know, just scheduling like a hundred different schedules is quite complex. 
So that's a call for everyone who is out there, who is, is creating such programs, such algorithms for, for, for school in the future, and also improving the accessibility of, of entire education. Where I live, close to uh, Stanford, it's East Palo Alto, they have 600 homeless kids out of 3,500 students who go and picked up from the shelter every day. So how we make this great model accessible for those students who cannot afford a private school. So that's going to be a key thing what we're working on. Um, three takeaways for today, I'm almost running out of time, is relationship and ownership are key to successful learning. B, technology complements the entire learning process and supports our systems. I think that's a key thing because also Lapster has measured that. I think in addition to the tool, the teacher is always needed because I think it's just um, a given. Then last is the ed tech needs to solve like holistic education problems and not just like content machines, etc. So it needs to be looking at the application as well or systems. Thank you very much. Thank you.